Just about the only words that Joe Biden can now say coherently are the words Putin's price hike, Putin inflation. This way, he hopes to divert the rising tide of anger in the United States of America at the economic disaster, which is beginning to overwhelm millions, tens of millions of Americans. His alibi, of course, ignores the fact uh, that the inflation in the United States and its attendant economic problems started long before uh, the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian armed forces on the 24th of February. In fact, a little remembered fact, the problems of the American economy were beginning to mount even before the COVID-19 pandemic and all the economic wreckage that that has wrought by the government as well as by the virus itself. Now, an economy that was headed south really dramatically before the pandemic is by definition in a real spot of trouble now. It's not just inflation. Although the $6 gallon of petrol is upon us, here in the United Kingdom, the two pounds per litre petrol and diesel is now upon us. At least it will be. I passed one in the middle of the night, not 20 miles from my house, where diesel had reached one pound 99.4 pence. So tonight it will undoubtedly cross the two pound mark. Even though the price of a barrel of oil is actually lower today than it was in 2009. Go figure how all that can possibly calibrate. It must be to do with futures and hedges and bears and bulls and all the other paraphernalia of the, um, the capitalist economic uh, model. We have a crisis in our model and therefore it seems inescapable to me that we have to start talking about a different model. If this is the best that our system can do, don't we need a new system? But back to Joe Biden for a moment. He has a ticking clock in the corner of the Oval Office, and that clock is set at the midterm elections in November, just a few months from now. At the moment, the so-called Democratic Party controls the White House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. And they're getting nothing done. Uh, they are achieving less than nothing. They are making every matter worse in the United States with one-party government. Were well, the Democrats to lose control of the Senate, maybe even of both houses of Congress, this coming November, then Joe Biden will be, by definition, a lame duck president. He will be able to achieve precisely nothing and all the ill-pronounced, ill-articulated pronunciamento that are being whispered in his ear or written in very large letters on idiot boards in front of him will be of no moment whatsoever. The people who will run the US government will be his enemies in the Republican Party. And two years after that, Joe Biden has to stand for re-election. An old, feeble, senile man. A man that you would not trust to send out for a loaf of bread. If he could get a loaf of bread two years from now. We'll have to run for election because if it is not him, it'll be somebody even worse than him by the name of Kamala Harris. Unless, unless, someone is going to challenge Joe Biden for the Democratic Party's nomination. And that is a distinct possibility. And I believe, and I spoke to a very wise man who's on the show later, uh, this evening about that possibility and he persuaded me 
that Hillary Clinton has not given up. That even though her and Bill and Barack are really running the show in the White House, she wants it for herself. She cannot bear to be the candidate that was defeated by Donald J. Trump. And why do I labor this point? January 6th. The only reason why the entire American state and its media are trying to crank up like a starting handle on a cold morning at the hearings into the so-called insurrection, which would be a rather tame demonstration in central London or the center of most capitals of most countries on a wet Tuesday, but are now being billed as a civil war act, as an act of treason and insurrection. The reason that they have to talk this matter up is they have to put Donald Trump out of the race. Because if Donald Trump fights Joe Biden, or Kamala Harris, or Hillary Clinton, or any lesser mortal, lesser known mortal at least, then Trump wins hands down. In the latest polling in all of the battleground states, Donald Trump beats all Democratic comers. So the only way to do that is therefore to put him out of the race. And that means to criminalize him, to charge him, and convict him before he has the chance to become president of the United States again. But that would be an act of civil war in itself, an act that would be unlikely to be accepted with equanimity from the scores of millions of Americans that would quite like Donald Trump to be their president again. Are they going to allow some kind of lawfare in the United States, in the Republic, to deprive them of the chance to elect a former president back into the White House. I doubt that very much. So whilst talking interminably about acts that could precipitate civil war, the Democrats almost certainly, in my view, have in mind their only stratagem to create conditions for what could become a real civil war in America. Well, some people would be quite happy to see that happen, but I'm not amongst them. I pray for the stability and progress of the United States of America, as I do all countries. It is not a good thing to have a society as sick in the head as American society currently is. You're probably, if you're not in the United States, still talking about the massacre of 19 children and two brave school teachers near the Mexican border, the Ross High School. But that was 22 mass shootings ago. Yes, since that mass shooting, which is fixed in your mind, there have been 22 subsequent mass shootings in America. This is a sick country, indeed, not just economically sick, but psychologically sick. And on top of that is the sickness of grandiosity, the sickness of imagining that a country with so many problems of its own must go out around the world creating problems in other people's countries. I've just looked at a headline in the American press this day. Congress divided on how to tackle LGBT rights in China. What do LGBT rights in China have to do with the American Congress? And at least does the American Congress not have problems closer to home? on which it should be focusing. I saw Juan Guaido, remember him? The president of Venezuela, self-appointed, recognized by the United States, given billions of dollars. God knows where that money went. To my surprise, he's still living in Venezuela. 
and he got into a rumpus by marching into a cafe yesterday. And Anthony Blinken took to the rostrum ex cathedra denouncing people in Venezuela for being mean to a man that they have never elected, but Blinken regards as their president and is giving them their money with which to pretend that he is the president of Venezuela. American bases everywhere. I just watched John Pilger's coming war with China. Epic, and I mean epic, documentary on Netflix. The United States has 800 military bases around the world. And most of them are surrounding Russia, China, Iran, Venezuela, all the countries that the United States has designated foolishly as its enemies. But the ones surrounding China are about the attempt to blunt, to block, to break the People's Republic of China, almost by definition an unstoppable force, a China that cannot be stopped. The U.S. is burning its money and its political credit around the world in a vain attempt to taunt, to lure China into the same kind of confrontation uh, that they have lured Russia into in the Ukraine, to which I now turn. No sensible military commentator anywhere now any longer denies that Russia has begun a series of decisive victories in the war in Ukraine that will partition the country in the later part of this year. The only argument being where that partition boundary border will be. No serious political commentator, no serious newspaper is any longer pretending as they were for more than a hundred days that Ukraine was winning the war. Everyone serious now accepts that Ukraine has lost the war, that the, by my calculation, $75 billion sent to Ukraine has been burned and wasted, except where it's turning up on the dark web at $30,000 a javelin missile coming to an airport near you, coming to a bank robbery near you, wherever you are, being purchased on the dark web by terrorists and organized criminal gangs. All of that money, your money, has been wasted. And thousands upon thousands of Ukrainian soldiers have given their lives for nothing in a war that is lost and need never have been fought. All it needed was a pen and Zelensky's signature that Ukraine would not join NATO and would implement the Minsk I and II agreements that he had already signed under the guarantee of Germany and France. And all of those young men in the Ukrainian armed forces would still be alive. How's that for a crime? And that crime too originates in Washington, in the sick society. Lyndon Johnson talked about the great society. Now we have the sick society. But of course, none of America's orders could have been carried out quite so comprehensively if the European leaders had not themselves been spineless satraps of a declining empire run by a sclerotic, gerontocratic, 80-year-old man who can't tie his own shoelaces or button up his own dressing gown in which he wanders the corridors and haunts the lavatories of the White House in Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and lastly, I turn to my own country. The most enthusiastic of the satraps 
the bootlicker of all bootlickers, the once great Britain, led by a mountbank, led by a cad, a bounder, a rascal that even when I entered Parliament, not an aeon ago, but 35 years ago, would have been horse whipped out of the building on account of his personal conduct, his dishonesty, rank dishonesty on a scale unseen even in the Augean stable of Westminster over the last century or so in London in the United Kingdom. Our Prime Minister won a vote of confidence amongst his own members of Parliament. Well, I say won, but he won it with such a large number of his own colleagues against him. One has to wonder if he will not go the way of all Tory flesh, having had a vote of confidence falling from power very soon afterwards. More colleagues voted against Boris Johnson than voted against Theresa May, his immediate predecessor, in her vote of confidence. Boris Johnson survived, but will he survive the two by-election crushing defeats to which he's headed this very month? Will he survive two pounds £2.50 a litre of diesel, will he survive the coming winter in which our people will be forced to choose between heating and eating? Will he survive the untying or even cutting of the Gordian knot, which is the Northern Ireland protocol in the ongoing battle with the European Union, which we struggled so mightily to withdraw from, but ended up doing on everything that matters exactly the same things as we would have done if we had remained in the European Union. Talk about an opportunity missed. Johnson had the chance to make a truly independent, truly Great Britain, a world power with a seat on the Security Council of the United Nations, with a brand name recognized everywhere in the world, with a language which is the lingua franca of commerce, of the internet, of the financial world, and of much of cultural and journalistic and broadcasting discourse as this show itself proves. But he threw it all away. Boris Johnson has thrown it all away. Joe Biden was dealt a lousy hand and has played it badly. Boris Johnson was dealt the best hand ever from the deck in a century in Britain. And he threw it all away also. 